Welcome to another episode of the Meter Cute Interviews here on Meter and Mayhem. Today, I'll be chatting with Jessica Rainey, an old friend who grew up in the hills of southeastern Ohio, looking for the Mothman and every other thing that goes bump in the dark Appalachian night. These days, she resides in Houston, Texas, and translates her love of Appalachia into stories that combine crime, fantasy, and horror into Appalachian supernatural noir. Her latest book, Root and Bone, is out now from Cursed Dragon Ship Publishing. Are you ready to see what kind of creatures Jessica has in store for us? Me too. Though, spoiler alert, it's cats. There's a lot of cats in this video. They're going to figure very prominently in this particular interview. Get ready. All right. Sit back, relax, and get ready to fall in love. Hi, I'm Jessica Rainey, and I will be reading a selection from my um, upcoming book, Root and Bone. Um, no introduction. I'll just start reading, and hopefully um, we can pick it up and see what it's about. Fiona and Jewel hiked up and over the hill, then descended into the familiar holler that evoked comfort and safety as soon as they stepped off the trail and into the green wonderland. Just as it had from the first day, they'd seen it so many years ago. Granny Kay kept spectacular herb and magic gardens. Even in the late fall weather, things grew all around, wild looking, but controlled by Granny Kay's expert hand. Birds were plentiful and chirped happy little bird songs as a pleasant fall breeze riffled the orange and gold leaves around. The grass was soft underfoot and well tended by the goats and the donkey. He trotted over when he saw the girls emerge from the woods. He snorted and brayed at Jewel, then nickered at Leona and lowered his head for his customary ear scratching. That thing is a menace, Jewel said. She eyed him warily and kept her distance. Jewel had had more than a few bites from the donkey over the years. Well, he's a useful menace, Granny Kay said. The old woman knelt in her garden, planting some fall bulbs. Her bright white hair shimmered and shone in the crisp fall sunshine, and her blue eyes sparkled. She smiled at them and raised her ancient body up from the ground. He keeps bears away and other unsavory types that would like to wander in here. She hugged Jewel, then looked over at Leona. I'm sorry. She hugged Leona, then looked over her glasses at Jewel. Someday, you might find yourself needing a menacing donkey. You've always been one to cultivate incivility, Jewel. She hugged Jewel, too, then wrapped her on the head. You best stop poisoning your husband. That ain't the way to manage a man. How did you know about that? Jewel asked. Oh, I got my ways, Granny Kay said. There's ways of looking out that you ain't bothered to know yet. You keep drugging people like that, and sooner or later you'll make a mistake and kill them dead, she said. Well, that might not be a mistake, Jewel said. Jewel Elizabeth Spencer, that better be just your smart mouth and not how you really see it. Magic can come and magic can go if you don't act right. Maybe it goes when you need it most, so you best be careful about how you treat it. You don't use it so you can go dance in the jitterbug out at the honky-tonk and ignore your home duties. Well, what if I don't want them home duties? Jewel asked. She crossed her arms and pouted. Granny Kay elbowed Leona and cackled. Looky there, Jewel. You best pull that lip back in before a birdie comes along and poops right on it. She pointed a gnarled finger at Jewel. You don't want them home duties, then ditch that man properly. Well, he ain't so easy to shake, Jewel said. Well, that's why you have to be cautious about him. She turned her attention to Leona. The old woman felt around Leona's bruised eye and cheek. You as well, Leona May. Leona nodded. Yes, ma'am. Well, Come on inside then and have some tea. We'll sort both of you girls out, I expect. Inside, the little cottage was warm and cozy. Every manner of herb hung drying in the rafters. Granny Kay's workbench was full of jars and projects, and the whole place smelled earthy and herbaceous with the tinge of magic prickling at the nose. A little fire crackled in the hearth, and Granny Kay had a kettle going in no time. She moved around her space deftly. Jewel and Leona sat at the table in their own spots, the ones they'd sat in for years, as Granny Kay tutored them in lore and magic. Jewel on her left, Leona on her right. Granny Kay put the tea down for them and gave them each a cookie. Then she sat in the middle. Now, tell me what trouble you girls have gotten up to. Leona pulled the little bag from her satchel and set it on the table. Kay stopped what she was doing and stared at it. Where did you get that? 
Kay's voice was quiet and calm, but there was a deadly seriousness about it that immediately alarmed both Leona and Jewel. Leona felt her stomach churn, and when she looked over at her sister, Jewel's face had gone pale and her lips pinched at the corners. I found it. There's a missing girl, and me and Jewel set out to find her. I found it in her desk drawer at her house. Did you touch it, either one of you? Kay asked. No, ma'am. I used silver to pick it up and wrapped it up with a rune on a paper, Leona said. Well, that's something then, Kay said. She seemed to breathe easier, but the tension and worry were still there. Well, I didn't touch it neither, Jewel said. She gave Leona a dirty look. I told her she shouldn't have used the I, sh I told her she shouldn't have even used the rune because we couldn't be sure. You never said that, Jewel, Leona scoffed. I did too, Leona, and I wouldn't let it in my house. We cleansed it outside. Quit that picking. This ain't no time for it. What do you mean you cleansed it? Kay asked. We'll use salt and herb circle, Leona replied. And what did it do when you burned it? Kay asked. Stunk, screamed, burned bright blue, but you can see it didn't char or do nothing to it. Jewel went to pick it up, but Kay reached out lightning quick and smacked her hand away. If you ain't touched it, don't. But we cleared it out. You can feel the energy gone from it, Leona said. Is it still dangerous? It may very well be. It's best not to get complacent, Kay said. She sat down at the table and relaxed a bit, but she didn't take her eyes off the bag. Leona could see the possibilities and the next steps whirling through Kay's mind as she consulted lifetimes of spells and lore, looking for the answer she needed. You want me to show you what's in it? Leona asked. Granny Kay shook her head. I already know. Hair, fingernails, and blood. Leona and Jewel looked at one another. Both girls' face looked relaxed. If Kay already knew what was a, knew all about it, then they were less worried. Kay always knew. I figured the hair was Mary's, the missing girl, and probably the blood too, but the nails don't look human. They were thick and yellow, like they had a fungus, but something worse. Who do they belong to, Leona asked. Nobody you're ever going to care to meet, Kay said. You're partial, right? The hair belongs to the girl. The blood belongs to whoever made up that curse bag. And the nails... Kay paused. I ain't going to say his name, not here. Leona's stomach flipped and churned. Kay wasn't afraid of anything or anybody. Her magic was safe and loving, but powerful. You could feel it. You just naturally understood not to try her. So if Kay were suddenly cautious and not repeating a name like this, Leona was worried. Can't be that bad, Joel said. It can be, and it is, Kay said. I thought you said not to be afraid of names. Joel had defiance set to her jaw. I believe what I said was to respect names, but to know when to keep your mouth shut, Kay said. A lesson you ain't mastered yet, Joel Elizabeth. Joel backed down, but pouted. Leona ignored her. Ma'am, what was that thing? It's a curse. It's cursed It's cursed that missing girl, and it's cursed whoever found it. Kay sipped her tea. You didn't touch it outright, so that's good, but I fear it won't be enough to keep it off you. What's the curse going to do? Jewel asked. Her curiosity trumped her surliness at being called out. Jewel did love a curse. I don't know. It'll take me a while to figure that out. You best leave it here and let me study it. If we can't work up a counter, if we don't we can't work up a counter if we don't know its intent. Not for sure, anyways, Kay said. Maybe we can just try a bunch of counters and one will catch it, Leona suggested. Well, let's see what we see first, Kay said. One thing I do know is that you won't find that missing girl alive. Leona nodded. I think so, too. I reached out for her and didn't get no bounce back. I think we ought to do a locator spell, Jules said. Yes, do that. Jules proficient at that. You got something of hers then, Kay asked. Jewel gave Leona a smug look at Kay's compliment. She enjoyed being better at things than Leona and knew that those locator spells and Leona and knew that those locator spells and Leona's struggle with them was a source of annoyance, one she loved to exploit regularly. Yes, we got Mary's hair. Leona narrowed her eyes at her sister, but otherwise didn't antagonize her. She looked back to Kay. The old woman ignored the pick and two. You girls need to be cautious. There's something nasty at work here, and this means and this mean little pouch is just the start. Don't take no chances. Keep up your wards, and don't do any frivolous magic. She cast a stern look at Jewel. You may need that energy. You girls listening to me? Both Leona and Jewel nodded. Yes, ma'am, they answered in unison. Good. And another thing. Don't be traipsing through the woods after dark if you can help it. What is it? What's out there? Leona asked. 
Many things of late, some of them ain't been real friendly, Kay said. From the look of this bag, I'd say they're about to get real unfriendly. She sipped her tea, then looked at Leona and Joel. Go on and finish your tea. Get on home before dark. I said my piece and counted to three. Both Leona and Jewel nodded. That was the end of it for now. They knew. Thank you. Wow. Thank you for that for that reading, Jessica. Um, I I love the way your work is sort of it's deadly serious, but then there's also like little bits of humor that get that get thrown in there. Um and I just I really I really love that about about your your work, your stories and your whether they're mystical stories or sort of more um based in real life. They've always got that little touch of humor. That's super fun. Yeah, thank you. I think that uh humor is important when you're writing darker stuff sometimes. I mean, sometimes there's a place for it, of course, but I definitely think that when you put just a little bit in it, it kind of cuts it, you know, it, it gives it more meaning when you do go really, really dark and the possibility that the reader or the, if in a movie, you know, the person who's watching it isn't going to be completely inundated with awfulness. Um, they're going to get those little bits of funny or sad or whatever, you know, you put in it to cut the gruesome if you're going to use gruesome. And I like to use gruesome a little bit, not too much, but I do like it a little. <laughs> a little gruesome. A little gruesome. Um, I also love as you know, nothing you could time, but like in the story, as you were talking about they were like what's out there, you know, Granny K, what's out there, da 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 da. <laughs> One of the cats went zoom right behind yeah. you. <laughs> Wait, that's definitely dead. the meanest thing behind me um so we're lucky in this one at least uh one of them didn't puke behind me that happened um when i did my cover reveal for the book the cat like literally had a hairball come up like right when i was on camera i'm like oh my gosh awesome well right. again my brand it's fine right <laughs> yeah <laughs> lovely lovely well because you've got you have one dog and then how many cats do you have? I have unfortunately three cats right now. Yeah. Okay. One dog, three cats. There's gotta be a lot of mayhem in your in your apartment for sure. So my question is, what's a book that's caused the most mayhem in your life? The most mayhem in my life from a book. Um I would say it's uh, the one that I'm currently releasing, and I don't just say that because I'm going to be releasing it in a few weeks. Um, this book took a lot of time. Uh, I wrote it way before COVID and then kind of shelved it because COVID and, um, you know, just trying to get my head around that. I'm nobody's sure what's going to happen. Uh, and then it went to, then I submitted it to a publisher and started the work on that and you know it was really the first time that I'd worked with I mean I'd worked with editors before on short stories and stuff but I'd never really worked through a whole book and having somebody else like in my space really like you know the book is the story is your space until you send it out to the world and then it becomes in everybody else's space and it was the first time I let anybody in that seemed to have as much interest in it as I did and that was it was a lot to work through um that process was a lot to work through, but really rewarding because the product you get at the end of it is this cool collaborative effort that transcended what you originally, you know, thought it was going to be, you know, it made it so much better because somebody else cared about it as much as I did. And that was um, that, but it has created uh, a lot of mayhem and uh, work and continues to, I still have a lot of stuff to do today after this to go like change websites and all the stuff that I am no good at um, that ends up being like a mayhem thing in my life. So, you know, it's like I say, it's the third job I have because, oh, there's a cat. Oh, that's your cat. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> I like it. I think they're in cahoots somehow, the cat network. They have like a, I think, feel like there's a psychic cat network of the universe that they all know when they're supposed to do stuff. Right. So. Yeah. They're like, this is the interview. We're going to. Yeah, we're kitten. gonna shine we're gonna shine yeah the kitten is currently like buzzing around my feet acting like he's never been around my feet before and he's you know 
like eight months old so you know <laughs> there's it's mayhem all around book mayhem cat mayhem <laughs> I'm sure we'll get some dog mayhem here in a little bit but yeah probably my book and secondary to that I mean I'm gonna go on a limb and I'm gonna say Twilight because I feel like I have defended Twilight too much in my life um because I honestly feel like whatever story you like is your story you know I don't if someone tells me a book and I don't I didn't like the book I don't like want to go off on them and be like here's the reasons why this book is terrible blah 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 I'm just like good for you or when people say that somebody oh that was a bad book written by a bad writer and you know I can't believe it has made all this money and blah 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 I'm like well commercial success and quality are never simultaneous not never simultaneous but they're not guaranteed to be right. and also I begrudge nobody anything like you can have whatever you like I I don't care I hope that one of my books someday is as successful um and I can tell you from reading my own reviews that there ever everybody has an opinion and it's going to be very different and if you're a writer you better get used to people having different opinions of your work because not all of them are going to be praise and glowy and five star. Some will be three and some will be four and some will be two and some will be one. Hopefully not that many of them for you, but they will be all over the place. So I've defended Twilight too much already. I'll give that up. But it's a mayhem book in my life because it keeps coming up, especially among like indie writers for some reason. They really begrudge Twilight. <laughs> um. So I know you said that you've defended it too much already, but do you want to, you've got a platform here. <laughs> do you want to, do you want to give a, give a couple of hot points about, um, about, about Twilight? No, no. I, I mean, I'm just, I think that if I were to like complain heavily about another writer's book that just leaves for them to complain heavily about mine and I don't want I think that's negativity that none of us need um like anything with feedback take what you take what's useful to you and leave what isn't and um I'm happy for everybody that puts a book out there because it's hard work so hard work that that is true um what would you say is um what feels like the hardest part of putting a book out there and i um, and from any any part in the process from conception to like marketing like anywhere in in the arc what what's been the hardest for you so the hardest is um the hardest is just letting it go, right? It has to be finished enough at some point to be published. And of course you decide when that is or your publisher does, I guess, if you're working with one. Um, I've had both situations where I was the publisher, you know, I've self-published some stuff and I have worked with a small press publishing. So the process is very different in the two because, um, you know, when I... When I work for myself, I can tweak and fiddle fart around with it and do whatever I need to do for however long. When you work with a publisher, you're generally on a schedule because they have other stuff to do too. So you have to be uh, efficient at, you know, doing the drafts and getting them edited and sent back and doing all the stuff you need to do. That's, that's kind of difficult if you're not used to that kind of project management. I mean, I do it in my nine to five. So, you know, project management is not something I'm unfamiliar with. But um, when you work with the publisher, you learn to be a little bit less precious about it and um, definitely learn to get a thicker skin um, because they're really just trying to help you out with the work and make it as best as possible because, you know, they have an interest in it being good. But at some point you put it out in the world and people start to read it. And that's always, it feels great because that's what you intended but then it's a little bit scary, not a little bit, it's a lot scary too, because you're putting yourself out there. Um, and I've gotten better with every book. I mean, uh, when my Facebook memories popped up yesterday and it was like the very first book I put out myself was a collection of short stories called Oddballs. And I look back on that now and I mean, I, they're fine. They're, they're the work of an emerging writer and that's what it should be. It's a, it's a mark in time. It's like when you take a school picture and you have 
wonked up bangs or you had Cheeto dust up your face or something. It's a mark of you in time at that time. And it's to, I mean, it's to be celebrated and remembered for that. But then everything you do gets a little bit better, a little bit tighter. Um, you know, oh, there's a cat going across the screen now. Um, it gets a little bit tighter. It gets better. You evolve, you learn, you learn what not to do in, in this next book. And you hopefully have the best thing you're working on right now. So, you know, like Root and Bone is the best thing I've written because it's the last thing I've written. And I want it, you know, that's that's normal. What I'm writing now, I think is even better right i'm like okay the sequel to root and bone is even better than root and bone and it should always be like that um at least i think it should be for me anyway i can't i shouldn't speak for others but the hardest part's just letting it go and being out there because it's never done you would i would tweak it a million times and it wouldn't make much difference it would make a whole lot to me and none to anybody else so <laughs> right all the all the you know Put a comma in, take the comma out. Put the comma in, take the comma yeah. out. Ooh, is that word right? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Do I really want to use that word? No. Oh, okay, fine. I, I don't get too hung up on that, but yeah, when I when I agonize over something, I usually agonize over like a bigger plot point, even though it's at that point in the editing, it's too far for that. I'm like, well, you can't go back and change a whole plot point, Jessica. If I was doing it for myself, I could. As for a publisher, I can't do that because I'm on a, a time schedule. If they didn't note it, although I guess I, I should back that up. I am responsible for whatever I put out ultimately. If I think that it needs changed, it needs changed. And my uh, publisher and my editor is awesome at that. She agrees whole, full, full heartedly, wholeheartedly if that's the case. But again, sometimes you just have to let it go. That is true. Um, does working with a a publisher versus going the self-publishing route, does it feel um, logistically lighter? Like, do you feel like you can focus more on the writing because you're not focusing as much on the logistics of the whole thing or has it not made that much of a difference for you? Um, yeah, I would say so. You know, when you're doing it yourself, um, well, I'll say this, like a lot of things are going on simultaneously when you're working with the publisher because they have other resources I don't have, right? You know, they, I have a developmental editor, I have a copy editor, um, they use a cover artist. So they can, when they manage the project, they can be doing several things at once, right? They're going to format it. They're going to do all that stuff. I don't have to worry about that. I mean, formatting is a lot easier now with like the software that's available. I mean, Vellum is super easy. You just drop it and go. It's not difficult. But like if you want it to be, you know, customized and cool, like I give my editor, formatter, publisher full credit. She really did some cool stuff with the inside of the book, um, put some little cute graphics in there that, you know, make you feel like you're reading a magical book and, um, I wouldn't have thought to do that. So that's where that kind of stuff comes in. I would have just plopped it and gone with it. Like, oh, it's a number. Chapter seven looks great. Um, nothing cool on it. Even though I, I feel like I'm an artistic person and I would have never been able to do the cover stuff. So it takes a lot of the worry off of doing things like that. Um, you know, when you're, no matter who you are, I guess, unless you're like, you know, Neil Gaiman or Stephen King or somebody like that, you still do a lot of the legwork yourself about promoting yourself and, you know, where are you going to do a book launch and how are you going to, are you going to sign somewhere? Are you going to do all this stuff? I still kind of do that, but um, the meat and bones of it, you know, I'm on a schedule. I have a, I have a due date for each draft. It goes there. I just work on it in between. Um, so that has helped a lot when I'm doing it myself. And honestly, the deadlines and stuff really help out because, um, you know, just forces you to kind of focus and get it done. Um, that sounds kind of like not creative, I guess, get it done. But at, a, at some point you can't fix what you didn't write. So like if my first draft is going to be a total disaster, you know, I, I wrote a book. Um, it's a seed once sown. It's in a, a fantasy genre that I wrote for them. Um, and I was playing around in somebody else's world. And the first draft was like, I just knew it wasn't great. I'm like, but you know, at this point it needs to go to the editor. Cause I, you can't, she can help me fix it. Right. Like just write it. We can, stuff can be added. Stuff can be taken away. You know, direction can be changed, but it's best to get it 
to that person. And that's, what's really changed. My drafts don't have to be perfect. I have to trust the process, trust the editors, trust the process. Cause it does work. So that's, what's really different. Nice. The trust. And I love what you said about, you can't fix what you didn't write. Yeah. That's, I need to, I think I'm going to like get that on a, get that on a little, well, <laughs> Let's face it. I was going to say like on a little plaque or something, but I'm going to like type it into the computer and then I'm going to print it out because that's the kind of middle-aged woman I am printing out. Yeah. Things. Oh no, that's but, what I would do as well. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I want that like while I'm, while I'm working, like you can't fix it if you don't write it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, something that's really helped me with that is uh, occasionally I will do those uh, New York city midnight competitions where they give you like a genre and then a word that has to appear or maybe a character or a place or something. They give you prompts anyway. And they're pretty restrictive um, as far as like, if you don't have, like if your word is like banana and you don't have a like that word in there somewhere, it's disqualified. But what that competition does, and you're on a time crunch, right? So you usually have maybe 48 hours and some of the competitions you have 24 hours to do it. It forces you to just, streamline process focus get it out there and then you know you're not going to get paid it's not it's it's not paid and it's not published at that point so you're free to like once that story is submitted for the competition you're free to then go edit it and do whatever you want but you're going to get like a working thing then you get feedback from the judges afterwards so you can take all that and fix it it does not have to be a perfect story but i do think that those have helped me really push that home. Like I'm writing for this specific moment right now. I can fix it later. Um, if I wanted to expand the story or whatever, you know, I think I just finished up 250 word micro fiction one and I made it through the first round, didn't make it through the second round, but I love the story. And I take the feedback that the judges gave me, weigh it, see if I want to make that change. I can make that story bigger than 250 words. I can keep it there. You know, a lot of places like flash. So, um, but it's written and I can now do with it whatever I need to. And I always keep that in mind when I'm writing something bigger or another project, because I can always go back and change it. Um, it's not, I didn't write it in stone or blood or whatever. So it's not like holding me to it. I, I can always go back and change it, yeah. but I can't, if I didn't plurp it out in the first place, you got to plurp it out in the first place. <laughs> yep. Um, do you, speaking of flash, um, have you ever submitted any of your stuff to um, Flash Boulevard? I haven't. No. I feel like um, Francine Witt, who is there at least at the time of this recording. So, and I'm assuming depending on when people view it and you know, it could be five years down the road that people see this. But anyway, right now, uh, Francine Witt is, is the editor on their Flash stuff. And um, I feel like she would really connect with your, with the sort of dark, dark end of her of, of your stuff I just finished reading her um her new collection radio water that's all flash and I I feel like I feel like there's a connection between her work and your work so oh well I wonder if she would enjoy an ode to Joey Chestnut champion hot dog eater from the Nathan's hot dog contest because <laughs> that's available for purchase I'd be happy to sell that <laughs> oh that's right I forget you know, I forget because you, um, we sort of come from different writing worlds in terms of expectations of remuneration and compensation. <laughs> um, I don't think, I don't think they pay, um, oh. but you are, I don't more honestly, I don't expect to get paid. I just would like to get paid, you know, so, I mean, it would buy some new cats. <laughs> But don't, don't you have the, the one cat's only like eight months old though, right? Like you Yeah, still... but I'm thinking of trading all these ones then and getting me some new ones because they're annoying today. It's fine. They're having oh. a fight over here. They don't normally do this, but you know, there's something going on. So let's have a cat WWF style smackdown in the middle of my sofa. They, to me. They need to do it in the middle of the floor, like right over your shoulder. Tell them to, oh. move, to move it over a little. Yeah. Give them time. Give them time. <laughs> <laughs> the dog's hovering near here so he he usually shuts down any rowdiness right away he does not he, i call him paul blart mall cop because he shuts down the rowdy in this joint 
um, when they get going, but that usually doesn't prevent them. It just shortens it. <laughs> oh, well, I'm glad you have your little, little dog narc there to, um, yeah. to keep things under control. Um, so thinking about a lot of the things you've said, I'm wondering, um, if you could go back and meet your younger self at, at any point in your, in your life, what kind of advice do you think you would give to a younger version of Jessica? Um, you know, I thought about this question before this and I think I would tell her not to be afraid of, of paths that didn't involve the path I took, which was science. I mean, yeah, there we go. That was the dryer. Sorry about that. The dog. He doesn't. Paul Blart is alerting me that the dryer is done. Um, I would go Doing back and tell my younger self not to be afraid of um, an uncertain pathway. You know, I always wanted to be a writer. I I mean, when I was in high school, if you would have asked me, I'd have been like, oh, I want to be uh, the head writer of Saturday Night Live. I mean, I really did want to do that. Um, I had no idea how I would ever do that, you know, and coming from where I came from, my parents were like, oh, you know, you have to have some sort of an engineering or science degree because you'll, you have to be able to support yourself and make money. And the arts don't make money. And unless you were a teacher, you know, I don't know, you know, that was the kind of the mentality and that wasn't true, and I, but I believed it because what else was I going to believe? But I would go back and tell her like, take the path you want to take. Um, because if it doesn't work out, you can always change directions. You know, there's nothing that says like, once you're on this path in life, like you must stay on this path. There is no such thing as that. And I would have said, take, take the road you want to take and explore that, you know, be responsible and support yourself and whatever, you know, but also there's ways to make money. You, you will always be able to make more money um, and support yourself. And there, there was a way, I just wish I would have done that. But then again, you know what? I'll pass lead where they lead. And um, I probably wouldn't have been in the position I'm in now, if I hadn't, I mean, I, not probably, I would not have been in my position now and be able to look back and say that, but I wish I would have stayed a little more creative. I've always tried to be creative no matter what, because I just, you know, I like art. I like writing. I like doing all that stuff. I wish I would have um, let that weird writer person flourish a little more um, and not tried to, but I love science too. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. Who knows? I mean, I guess you could love more things, but I would tell her not to be afraid and to, you know, do the things that make you afraid because it's, it's going to be fine. So, because I have known you get ready for the, get ready for this. Oh, yeah. Jessica. I have known you over 30 years. Yes. Um, I know, I know what your background is, but for folks out there who don't, cause you said um, like coming from where you came from, where um what's what's your background what kind of background did you grow up in yeah i lived in a tiny little town in southeastern ohio um called lowell ohio it's outside of marietta ohio which is a small town as well it's like the big city compared to lowell um i went to a high school where my graduating class was 85 people you know very rural um and, you know, I didn't grow up with like a silver spoon in my mouth. Uh, you know, my parents are working people and my dad's an engineer, you know, and my mom worked um, different jobs and stuff. It's a place, you know, the place is a place where when you get a job, you keep it because there's not really a whole lot of, you know, high paying stuff around if you don't work in chemical plants. So you, when you get a good job, you keep it. Um, and it's always their ideal that, you know, you have a sustainable income. So I come from the people, hardworking people who valued education, definitely wanted me to get one and wanted me to get bang for bucks. So I went into science, but yeah, I, I come from a rural Appalachian town. Um, and in fact, you know, I kind of modeled the place and the book on it. It's not, it's not exact, but if you read the book and know the area, you're like, oh, I know where that's at. So, but yeah, a little tiny place. Um, so, 
and getting out of there was important to me, you know, and you're like 18. That's the only thing. Oh my God, I got to get out of here. Uh, I think when I was 16, I couldn't think of anything more central to my being than living in New York city. And as you get some age on you, you'll be like, yeah, that might not have suited you so well. Cause I live in Houston now and it's a huge city, you know? Um, and I like the opportunities a city brings, but also when you're sitting in traffic and you're like, oh my gosh, I only needed to go five miles and it's taken me 25 minutes to go five miles. You're like, oh, I just wish I was on a back road somewhere. Um, and even though it took me 30 minutes to get to a store when I was a kid or 40 minutes, at least I was moving, you know? And when you're in the city, you just don't move. You're just kind of, you're as stuck in a city as you are in a little town. You just don't realize it, so. Huh. Did, um, okay, I'm trying to be mindful of the time, um, but I feel like I have so many more questions for you <laughs> right now um, because I'm wondering if that that idea that you just said about that if you're in a city, you're as stuck as you are in a little town, but you don't realize it. Do you think that that plays into any of your, your writing at all? Does that pop up? Yeah, for sure. Um, I actually had a friend of mine, she read a, a short, my short story collection and she was like, you know, the main thing I get from your collection is this idea of stopped, of, of stopped admired in a place and you can't get out of it. And I, I would think that, I mean, I agree with that. I never realized that when I wrote it, cause I wouldn't be that clever, but apparently I was and just didn't realize I was that clever. Um, but yeah, like the idea of like, one of my favorite devices is a time loop. Like I absolutely love like, um, a story where the person keeps like groundhog day, where you relive something over and over until you solve the puzzle. Like you have to solve it to get out of it. What if you never get out of it? What if you never solve the puzzle? Um, I love stuff like that. You know, I loved quantum leap when I was a kid, how he just keeps leaping around to places and it's like he's getting somewhere but you're never sure how close he is to finished or you know it's basically a time loop quantum leap is amazing um, but I love that device and I think that it really speaks to how I feel a lot of times is like all right you know I have a lot to be grateful for and thankful for and happy about but am I just kind of stuck here how do I move to the next level and that's also bad because you act, maybe you don't appreciate what you have around you. I appreciate it. Um, I just know, okay, I want to, I'm here and I want to experience another cool thing. Um, and remember the cool thing that I'm experiencing right now, but you know, life doesn't stop. You always move along. You always move along. But when you feel like you're not moving along, it just is that it's just a really good device for, um, a spec fiction story, or, I mean, in my case, a horror story, I think there's a really good slasher movie like happy death day where the girl keeps getting murdered over and over and it's hilarious like the movie is funny and scary at the same time i mean not super scary but um it's entertaining i love a good a good time loop it can be used many different ways but it's pretty profound sometimes too when you think about your own life and you think about being feeling stuck and that's never a good feeling it feels terrible um and then getting unstuck you know in writing too like i get stuck in a place in a book or I get stuck with a chapter I'm like I just want to get out of this chapter and when you get done with that when you finish it and you can move on to the next one it feels really good so um and then when you look back you're like why was I even stuck on that that wasn't that big of a deal but you're still stuck until you unstuck until you unstick you don't know <laughs> very true um do you feel like so there's I don't, I don't know if I want to say trend, but there's definitely more focus now happening on um, dark Appalachia. Yeah. How, because your work, I would say much of your work has the dark Appalachian vibe. And it was like years before, like when I first heard the term, I was like, oh, that's the kind of stuff that, that Jess has been writing, right? Like it was years before I heard the term right that I had was already reading your work so how do, how do you feel about the focus on on that right now I think it's awesome um I mean the Appalachian Mountains aren't they the oldest mountain range in the world like they're old 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 mountains um and so when you think about all of the things they have seen and been through and life's you know lives and people and animal everything it's really profound to think about something that old um, 
and the things that it's seen and what that, I mean, you know what the, you know what the things you have seen in your life, the scars they leave on you, but the scars that are left over like millennia of time, you know, time, huge chunks of time are unfathomable to human brains. I don't think we can fathom that. Um, so, and anybody who's ever, I mean, if you've lived there, and actually gone up in a holler somewhere and i say that term with the most love and respect i can say it i don't if i said hollow i would that would not be right it's a holler um and there's like a magic about them even if you don't believe in magic there's a vibe back up in those places that um it just lends itself to a good story no matter what kind of story you're writing there's a a, a thing there's a, just a, a vibe about it that does that I remember being one of the first short stories I ever wrote in fact I think it was the first I ever sent to a critique group I'd gone on vacation with my family we did what we called rainy con every year where we met somewhere um in like Tennessee West Virginia because it was more central my, my parents lived in North Carolina my brother did too and I lived in Ohio still and we would meet somewhere um in that general area the heart of Appalachia and stay for a weekend usually it was memorial day weekend and we all went for a hike up in the woods and we came across this like building up on a on the little mountainside and it was like a jail or a, a thing but there were no animals so like, there was nothing in it and it was too big to be just like for some goats or a sheep or a cow or something like that it was like human size but it was a full-on like uh enclosure like a zoo enclosure for a human being on the top of this mountain in tennessee wherever we were at west virginia tennessee and that like made my brain go what's in there what would you keep in there and so that's where i got the short story idea um and uh i remember like my sister-in-law read it after i wrote it i let my brother and my sister-in-law read it because they were there and my brother was like cool and my sister-in-law was like that's a good story, but it's not my thing. And she like closed the, you know, she like shut it down, but you know, that's, there's some weirdness. There's just a, a magic and a, a strangeness that you can find back up in those places. I mean, I could tell you a million stories of traipsing around, you know, looking for, I don't know. I had a friend who was looking for a puppy one time or something, and she needed to go way back up in this holler and, west virginia beyond parkersburg and i'm like i don't know about this mess but you know i we went and did it i remember going to a lady who told fortunes in her trailer back up in a holler with and she used playing cards not like tarot cards like literally a deck of 52 playing cards tons of stories like that it's it's rife with it and i love it i think that it's um maybe it's trendy now but you know there's room for everybody I, when i first started reading like uh, I went to this mystery bookstore and picked up a book by a guy named David Joy, who's an amazing writer. He writes Appalachian fiction and what I would call noir, and which is what I call what I work work into, just supernatural noir. Because I, you know, I'm going to add a vampire in it. I'm sorry, I'm just going to do that. Um, <laughs> I have to force myself not to add a monster into stuff sometimes. Like, don't put a monster, don't put a werewolf in that. Don't do that. Don't put a ghost. It's fine. You, it's good without the ghost. No, it isn't. Everything's better with a ghost. Um. But yeah, I remember, and they told me, oh, this is like um, Appalachian Noir. I'm like, that's a thing. And she said, I, I don't know, I guess, you know, it's kind of a new thing coming out. So I read all of that I can get my hands on. Um, and I, like I said, I love David Joy's work. He's got like four books, I think. And they're all crimey, grimy Appalachian, but with a beautiful prose. Um, he's also written books on fly fishing. So, you know, he's got like a gift for describing the setting um and i i love that vibe so i love it i think it's high time there's plenty of haulers out there available to discover weird stuff in if you want to so <laughs> true so a question i have also from that is if you could go back in time to or well no wait we're, we've already done that back in time we're doing that we're doing jumping forward so if an earlier jessica somehow got a time machine and came up and saw you now, like popped into your apartment a month, you know, saw the cats and dog running around and everything. Saw your life now. What kind of advice do you think an earlier Jessica would have for you? 
I think she would say, I thought we would have a flying car and you would be married to Tom Cruise. That's what my expectation was, Jessica. And you are clearly not leading up to my expectation. So flying car and Tom Cruise, she'd be disappointed that neither one of those was here. Um, but I think that, I think she would wonder about, um, you know, did you stay a little bit weird? I mean, yeah, I'm weird. Don't get me wrong. I'm weird. <laughs> okay. There's, there's weird here. Um, but I've always wanted to retain that weirdness that was in my writing, like when I was 10 years old, you know, writing stories about a hippopotamus in the bathtub and um, a witch that's mad about her taxes. And I don't know, there are just weird stories like that that I wrote when I was a kid. And I just wish I could keep that weird. And I, I think she would be like, yeah, um, but is it weird enough? And I... I would I would love to see it be even weirder. So probably just is it weird enough? Please stay weird. Um, please stay creative and also like, yeah, that's a lot of cats. <laughs> well, it wouldn't have been enough. Like it wouldn't have been enough for a ten year old Jessica. Ten year old Jessica would have wanted like twenty five cats and would have seen no problem with that whatsoever. Um, you know, I'm twenty nine now. I, know, I realize we've known each other 30 years, but I like to stay 29 forever. Um, <laughs> so I, uh, you know, I would have capped it. I've ca I have capped it. So <laughs> stay weird or get weirder. That's what I, I think she would say. I like it. I like it. Um, it be a little mantra as you're working on the, the midnight contests and stuff. When you get it done, then you just hear, is it weird enough? Could it be weirder? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Actually, the one I just wrote, it ended up being like about an elf on the shelf. Um, because the the prompt was snitching. So I wrote it and I'm like, eh, it's funny and it's awful. Um, uh, but it could it be funnier? Could it be awfuler? Could it be weirder? Probably. The next draft. Always the next draft. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I look I look forward to to reading your latest book and to all the things that will come from from all of your next drafts. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Hopefully they're weird. Wow, what a great interview that was. I hope you had as much fun listening as I did talking. Ah, <sighs> I was surprised that my cat behaved so well during that video. Um, folks who listened to this only on Spotify, you missed it. Um, my cat just kind of stood stoically in the corner of the screen, sort of half in and half out through most of the video. Um, <laughs> that is very rare for her. And uh, about five seconds after I turned off the camera, she started coming over to chew on the corner of my monitor. So, you know, couldn't last forever, but at least it lasted during the interview itself. I was quite appreciative, quite appreciative. And Jess's dog only barked like once, I think, during the recording. So good job, animals. Thanks. Um, one one thing that I want to throw out there after having interviewed uh, Jessica, and she and I have talked about this a little bit before. So we know each other from college. We were in the same residence hall in our undergrad at Ohio University, which representing Got the, got the cat, the glass I was using during the interview. Also, a little OU pride there. Uh, so we we were in the same residence hall on our first year of college and then remained friends throughout college and um, have been friends pretty much ever since, although sort of off and on, especially before, the, before social media, it was sort of more sporadic. And then once social media happened, in more contact that way. Um, and one of the things that I have always regretted um, about that time, especially, or not especially, oh, anyway, bad sentence construction. Pretend I didn't do that because I don't feel like editing this. So one of the things I've regretted about that time is that Jess and I never talked about writing. That, that she didn't talk to me about it um, back then. And uh, her advice is that she wishes, like her advice is sort of like, you know, 
go, go for it more, do the creative stuff more. And I think my advice that I want to tack on to that is also talk to your friends about it. Uh, you never know which of your friends also is harboring the same dream of wanting to be a writer. And maybe young, young folks these days talk more about things like this. I mean, I think, think y'all kind of do um, because of the internet. It, it's easier to find your people, find your community that way. But still throwing the advice out there just in case it's helpful is talk to your friends about it, about writing, about your desire to write. Don't hide it. Don't be afraid that people are going to laugh. Will some people laugh? Yes. And those people are assholes. But you may find that one of your other friends has a similar goal, has similar dreams. And I think, I mean, I was a bit of a, um, sometimes when people have shaky self-esteem, they may compensate by being pompous and pretending that they're cooler than they are. And I probably did that. There's no probably about that. There's no probably about that. Um, yeah. <laughs> so like I wanted to be a writer, but maybe I was pretending that I was sort of more established than I was because I didn't understand that when you're 18, very few people are established as writers. Um, and I'm almost 50 and uh, still pretty sure I'm nowhere near an established writer. I don't know. Uh, so yeah, so I can understand why one would not want to talk to somebody who was like I was at 18 about writing because I probably would have just turned it into something about me. Oh, wait, am I turning this interview into something about me? Damn it. I'll never learn. Thanks for stopping by.